Between 1980 and 1989, the horror genre gave us well over 200 slasher flicks. Most of them were cheap, and very few of them had much of a lasting impact on audiences. Aside from rabbit horror fans like us, that is. Flaws and all, though, we love most of these horrific endeavors. Taking the format of 70s classics such as Black Christmas, The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and, of course, the quintessential slasher movie, John Carpenter's Halloween, studios realized they could make a lot of money chopping up teens. So much so that the genre would collapse in on itself like a dying star before the decade was done. In the early 70s, I made a uh, horror film with Wes Craven called Last House on the Left, which had some notoriety and some success uh, initially. But as a byproduct, uh, both Wes and I got reputations as being people that would produce really disgusting stuff and cheap. You know? <laughs> so if, if you want to puke in a bucket and cheap, you know, call Sean and Wes. Finally, I got to do uh, some kids' films in the late 70s. I did a, uh, a Bad News Bears kind of rip-off film called Here Come the Tigers. And after we did that, we had this notion of doing sort of a, a soccer movie. Well, at that point, uh, everybody was saying what America really needs now is a good family film. So Sean and I set out and uh, he got the funding and God love him, we made two wonderful family films. And uh, once again, America had lied. It did not want to see good family films. <laughs> Evidently, uh, America wanted to see Halloween. Uh, because in 1979, Halloween was absolutely raking in uh, the box office dollars. I was playing around with titles, and one of the titles that just came into my head at the time was Friday the 13th. And out of frustration, I said, Friday the 13th. Christ, if I had a picture called Friday the 13th, I could sell that. He said to me, I'm going to make the scariest picture ever made. It's going to be called Friday the 13th. So, and I said, well, who am I to question? and I went to school basically on the movie Halloween, saw it once, figured out um, what a good horror film would need. First of all, you have to start with a prior evil, something that uh, happened a long time ago that was really bad. Then you have to have a group of adolescents, or slightly post-adolescents, who are in an environment in which they cannot be helped by adults. The other thing I learned from Halloween is that if you make love, you get killed. So I had to figure out a way to do that. We took out this ad in Variety that said, Friday the 13th, the most terrifying film ever made, was a great big block letters crashing through a mirror. He was very open about the fact that he was definitely going to make people sit up and watch this movie. Ta-da! Sean and I talked about all the possible places that it could be, and I came up with a summer camp. How far is it to Camp Crystal Lake? They have to watch themselves be thinned out one by one. <laughs> I had some theater owners from Boston who had invested initially in Last House on the Left, and they came in for a meaningful chunk. With all of that stuff in hand, suddenly I was able to raise the money to make a picture called Friday the 13th. You're going to camp blood, ain't you? When we were doing the setup for the movie, we, we hired this guy named Walt Gorney. The function of Crazy Ralph is to set the tone for this horrible geographic area. You're doomed if you stay here. We cast nobody that wasn't willing to go out and get dirty and have special effects applied to them and just accept it on faith we're going to go out and do all this stuff but i but i swear to god it's going to be okay but when you've had a dream as long as i have you'll do anything everybody was young and overacting <laughs> terribly overacting everybody hey wasn't that the road up for camp crystal lake back there we shot this picture in a tiny little town in new jersey called blair's town we shot completely below the radar out at a Boy Scout camp. Camp Nobi Bosco, that's what it was, which stands for North Bergen Boy Scouts. Camp Mud, they're opening that place again? We had to wait for the Boy Scouts to all go home and go back to school before we were able to come in, make a contribution to the Boy Scouts, and camp out there basically for three weeks or four weeks while we shot the movie. Uh, Steve, Cabin B's already. Jack and Marcy are going to get drenched. We didn't actually have a real whole script. We, we would get pages that day, and they would change what we did have. They'd change them the next day, you know? So it was kind of like we got to find out as we were going along. How are you? Well, I, I'm Mrs. Voorhees. The image always was of me was that I was this girl next door, 
And of course, I've always said that there wasn't a gal that ever lived next door to me that I wanted to be like. <laughs> I'm not afraid. Betsy Palmer had worked in television on the morning talk shows, and she was squeaky clean. Comparable to the Doris Day type. I was always trying to prove that I wasn't the girl next door. I had a Mercedes, which I'd had a number of years, and it broke down on the Connecticut Turnpike. So I said to myself, I need a new car, universe. <laughs> and I went out to go shopping for a car, and I found a little Scirocco. I thought, oh, that's what I want. I want a cool little car like this. And so the phone rang, and my agent said, how would you like to do a movie? I said, great, that'll pay for the car that I want to buy. And he said, well, that was, now there's just one other thing I have to tell you. He said, it's a horror film. And I said, oh, no. So the script came, and I read it, and I said, what a piece of... What monster could have done this? And I said, oh, nobody is ever going to see this. It will come, and it will go, and I'll have my Scirocco. The real iconoclastic part of Friday the 13th was taking mom an apple pie and standing it upside down and saying, you've never seen a mother like this. I didn't get up there and try to play a bad lady. In fact, I tried to play a good lady who had gone a little wrong, but that was because she wanted to save more children. She didn't want them to die. Oh, I couldn't let them open this place again. This was the mother that I never had, the one who would protect you and go to any horrible lengths to do it. <laughs> and you do, you want to do that. You want to all of a sudden get very kind of, ha, ah, ha, ha, I'm that bad lady. <laughs> and I was beginning to do that, and Sean would say, no, 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 Betsy. He said, just play it straight. That's all. Kill her, Mommy. Kill her. Kill her, Mommy. Kill her. What we needed to do was create something that had an element of circus in it. <gasps> but we had no idea how to do any of this stuff. I think Steve Miner uh, said uh, we should hook up with uh, Tom Savini, who had worked with George Romero on Dawn of the Dead. He would be looking through my screenplay and be saying, well, I noticed you have a, a, a hatchet in the face on page 38 or whatever it was. Um, and he turned to Sean and said, do you want a fake face and a real hatchet or do you want a fake hatchet and a real face? Savini just said, anything's possible. It was a highly technical special effect that literally they could only shoot once. I mean, when that uh, arrow comes through and the blood squirts up and Tom Savini is underneath the cot and he's squirting blood into this tube with this plunger so that it can come up through the fake rubber chest. After the shot, um, Sean says cut and everybody applauds and Tom Savini comes out from underneath the bed covered in blood and it's sheep's blood and he's, and he's going like this and it's just awful. Um, and somebody says, what happened? And he said, well, I." I started to hit the, um, the pump, and the fitting gave way. So blood was going all over the place, so he had to literally blow on the pipe to make the blood come up through the arrow and then look like Kevin Bacon was squirting all over the place. If you're going to sit there and blow sheep's blood up through a tube in Kevin Bacon's alleged chest, um, you're giving a lot. And then, of course, you get the one shot with the uh, hatchet in the face, which is, of course, the styrofoam hatchet glued onto the real face. And that was the other thing about it. You waited for the next one to happen. It's about the build-up to the tension. It's about the don't go in there. It's about, oh, don't go in there. Can I help you? One of the most memorable aspects is the music. It's iconographic now. It's that People come up to me, oh, you did. And everybody thinks it's cha-cha. I'm like, cha-cha-cha, what are you talking about? I got this idea from the picture. There's a close-up of Betsy Palmer's mouth. Get her, Mommy. Get her. Kill her. The mouth is going, kill her, Mommy. Kill, kill her, Mommy. So I got the wacky idea to take kill her, Mommy, uh, the first letter of, first two letters of kill, K-I, and Ma, M-A. And then there was a, a, a gizmo we had called an Echoplex, which we were using a lot in the film. Kill her, Mommy. Kill her. I went to the microphone, and 
I don't know why, but I, I just went and it went then I went and oh I went that's really <laughs> that's pretty spooky <laughs> so I think it's obviously a success because uh, everybody remembers it <laughs> and we were at the at the last 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 penultimate draft and Sean said Victor we need a chair jumper for the end um, and I said, okay, and I went back to my drawing board and borrowed from all of the best horror films I've ever seen. And so we have the dream sequence with Adrian King floating around in a rowboat and then the hand coming out of the water, and it's Jason. The ghost story is over, so you can turn on the lights. So Dawn comes up, and she's on this beautiful, placid lake. When the kid comes up out of the bottom of the lake, he comes up musically at a point where it's also unexpected. <laughs> Then you had the audience. The part of Jason, we wound up hiring Ari Lehman. He came out and did it. We were both so cold and freezing. They had the heaters there, and you know they had towels as soon as we came out. And we did it a few times. And I'm going, Sean, are you sure we want to do this again? He goes, we're going to get it. We're going to get it right. Don't worry about it. This is it. But I certainly did not suggest in that scene that he was hydrocephalic or, or, or deformed in any way. Tommy Savini showed me this Polaroid, and I didn't have my glasses on at that night. And I said, now who is this? He said, oh, that's your son, Jason. I said, why does he look so strange? He said, oh, he's a mongoloid. I said, what? I said, that wasn't in the script. He said, no, but they thought he didn't look weird enough, so we were making him up. Because of the nature of the nightmare ending, and uh, because they, uh, Sean had uh, Tom Savini on board as such a fabulous makeup artist, they turned him into sort of a monstrous looking uh, Cretan. I mean, he just looked awful. We had screenings for ourselves, but then we had the first screening that I recall for Paramount. And if you recall the ending, when that head pops up, I swear people just jumped out of it. And I think that's the thing that sold it. And the next thing I know, uh, Paramount has bought the movie and is gonna do this massive release in all these theaters. I'm going, wow. Warner Brothers took foreign distribution, Paramount took domestic. At that point, Frank Mancuso was running distribution for Paramount, and he made a choice to take this no-star independent film, release it nationally with a national budget, and see what happens. And the notion of doing an independent film that would ever be released nationally had never occurred. The opening night on Broadway, it was just packed. It was packed. What are all these people going to see this movie? Do they know what they're going to see? And I guess they did, you know. Man, they jumped every single time something happened. There were real screams. Screaming, running out of the theater in the middle of the film, just screaming and yelling. Come on, you guys. The best part of watching Friday the 13th in theaters, and I was watching the audience say, don't go in there. You know, I mean, literally talking to the screen saying, girl, don't go in there. Uh, you don't want to go there. And Sean would just go like, I got him. I got them all. The kids would come out of the theater telling the kids are coming in the theater. Oh, you better look out, or there was so much fun. And it became a really big social event. The next thing I knew, I was looking at the variety uh, results, and uh, we were in the top 10. People poured into the theaters to see this and kept coming and kept coming and kept coming. They started talking about 10 million, 20 million, 30 million dollars. When the film was released, by and large, it was dismissed by the critics as being exploitative and just not really worthy of attention. The critics universally hated it. I read that, uh, that I'm really awful and that the movie sucks and that we all suck. Uh, one of them was fit to be tied because I had done this movie. How dare I let my viewing audience down by playing this horrible woman? He said, you write to her. So there were people who were disappointed in me. Parents and educators would say, this is not a productive use of your time. The feminists didn't like it particularly. Who's going to die? Well, the slut's going to die for sure. And the good person, the virgin, she will survive. Did you live because you were a good girl?
I never bought into the notion of sex equals death, that the reason everybody gets punished in horror films is because they're sexually promiscuous. I was certainly raised that if you make love before you're married, you are going to get punished somehow. We weren't doing anything. We were just messing up. I'm not sure whether the vengeful, moralistic tone of the movie was anything I was thinking of consciously. I was basically working from what I had seen in my own movie-going experience prior to that, that if you were following your lustful heart, that you were going to get nailed for it. That was at least the Puritan ethic that I was brought up with. Just when it was getting interesting. I didn't look at it that way as, you know, the victim. I actually thought it was an empowering position. I lived. Have I written something that caused uh, people to go off? You know, or if there's a paranoid schizophrenic out there who's seen Friday the 13th 147,000 times, should I feel guilty if he goes out and murders somebody? Ma'am, we didn't find any boy. And he's still there. We started talking about doing a sequel within days, really, of the initial success. And that came directly from Paramount. You killed eight people, maybe next year you should kill 12 people. My friends in Boston felt it was really important to bring back this Jason character. Well, I thought that was just the worst idea I ever heard. I was completely wrong. <laughs> was no hockey mask, which became one of the icons of the film. It was never my idea to put a, a hockey mask on anybody because I had nothing to do with parts two through whatever. I said, I don't know who this guy in the hockey mask is. I would never have done what I did to Camp Blood if my little boy hadn't drowned. I said, he's at the bottom of the lake. Friday the 13th kind of became its own little industry, didn't it? The most important thing you can do in a film career is make money. Because if you make money, people will let you make more films and take other chances, and nobody will blame them. So I've had a lot of opportunities given to me as a result of doing this one little film in New Jersey. <laughs> oh, God help them. Uh, my kids may be producing Friday the 13th movies long after I'm gone. Even people who aren't huge fans of the horror film in general still point to Halloween as a magnificent film, groundbreaking film. But on the other hand, Friday the 13th, which came out only two years after Halloween, is looked upon with really universal derision. But the truth is, Friday the 13th is actually an extremely well-made and suspenseful film. The only difference is that while the murders in Halloween were in the shadows, off-camera, dare I say, classy, Friday the 13th, they were in your face. You actually saw a real live decapitation without a cutaway in full view of the audience. And audiences had never seen that before. They weren't prepared for it. And it was really no surprise that once they got a taste of it, they wanted more. Bloody birthday, the overwhelming horror. Bloody Moon, a film you won't soon forget. When you know how to celebrate, every day is Mother's Day. Final exam. He's come back. On the one night they were celebrating New Year's Eve, he was out, ending their life. I'm going to commit murder. This latest motion picture is another, you're making nothing but really big films now, aren't you? Uh, the, last one, the last one was uh, Money Pit, which uh, Steven Spielberg Pit, was yes, involved yes, in. That was... Yeah. And this one... <clears throat> This one with your Jackie Gleason? This is, yeah, it's, it's, it's big time, and we're making it with only big time folks, so I'm in the big time day. Where, uh, and there was a time, I guess, when you obviously were not in the big time. I did not make big time what films was, for a great majority of my life, as what, a matter of fact. Yeah. What was the, the first yeah. uh, film you made? Uh, the first actual appearance on camera I made yeah. uh, in a movie was a movie called He Knows You're Alone, which is an epic uh, hack and slasher film. You remember the hack and slash period of filmmaking? in which every movie had a knife rack in it. <laughs> you know, the girl would be at home and they'd pan across the kitchen, there would be a knife rack loaded, loaded, loaded with knives. And yeah. she'd hear a noise, she'd go off into another part of the house uh -huh. and she'd come back and there the knife rack would be without a knife in it. Yeah. Knife rack! <laughs> That's the type of movie that it was. How long ago was this? This was 800 years ago. This is 1943. Uh, this, uh, this, I believe, it was uh, 78, 79, something Was that like that. before your television show? Uh, yes, it was. Yeah, it was. I played a guy in this movie. Mm -hmm. I always said that if this was Gilligan's Island, mm -hmm. I would have played the professor. It was, it was that bad a role. <laughs> 
had nothing to do with it. And uh, did, was the thing released? It actually was Yeah, shown? it came out. When we were making it, when the guy wrote it, who was a very nice guy, very talented writer, it was called Shriek. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, it was called Shriek! <laughs> then, uh, while we were making it, it was called The Uninvited. Uh -huh. What did this mean? No. Nobody really knew. And uh, then, uh, uh, MGM, no, it, they cut it together and released it as Blood Wedding. Blood Wedding! <laughs> Uh, and then and there was finally, uh, finally came out under the title, He Knows You're Alone. He Knows You're Alone. The, uh, the whole title was, He Knows You're Alone, so don't go in the house because he's going to stab you with a knife. But they, 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 they and, uh, chopped it up. And this is the, uh, all of the victims were, were brides. brides. That was the deal. That the was psycho the... killer yeah. had to kill brides. Mm -hmm. Now, he could either walk into, you know, a place where a wedding was going on and, like, slash away, or he could overhear somebody talking about their wedding. Or go to Bloomingdale's, look through the registry. Yeah, I'm just saying. Yeah. Find out who's getting married. Ooh, number 709. <laughs> What's the pattern on the knives for this one? <laughs> I'm most interested in fear, the emotion of fear. For example, why after seeing Psycho were so many people afraid to take showers? Not me. I never saw the movie. You were afraid, right? You bet. Fear fascinates me. People pay to be scared. When you think about it, it's real ridiculous. At Lanier College, they have the finest security, the best teacher-student relations, strictly enforced curfews. Shh. What was that? And a killer. You had a situation where one film led to another, led to another. It wasn't as if, you know, the National Endowment of the Arts was throwing money at these producers because the slasher film was really helping the culture. It was that filmmakers, somewhat by accident, hit upon a formula that was so embraced by the mainstream movie-going teenage audience that they just took off. And for years and years, they producers and directors could really do no wrong. Any shitty movie with a holiday in the title, with a masked killer that was attacking usually scantily clad dressed females, just did bonanza at the box office. One terrifying night of unspeakable evil. New Year's Evil. In the early 80s, when the slasher film was in its heyday, this corresponded with the birth of the home video generation. So you had a whole new demographic of kids, of fans, who loved and devoured these films, who never in a million years would have been able to see them in the multiplex. Success breeds success. And imitation really is the sincerest form of flattery, and nowhere is that more apparent than in the slasher film. So while these great American slashers were in their heyday, you also had other countries trying to copy their success. You had Bloody Moon out of Spain, you had Snapshot, or The Day After Halloween from Australia, also from Australia. You had Nightmares, also known as Stage Fright. It had pieces, which was financed by American money. It had a Spanish director. It was set in the U.S., but actually filmed in Spain. And then, of course, you had all what we think of as prototypical American slashers, like My Bloody Valentine, Happy Birthday to Me, Prom Night Terror Train, that were really Canadian tax shelter movies, which were usually produced, directed, and starred by Canadian filmmakers. And now the latest breaking eyewitness news with Jerry Dumphy, Christine Lund, Ed Arnold for Ted Dawson with sports, Johnny Mountain with the weather, and the eyewitness news team. Horror movie opened tonight in Hollywood officially and all over the Los Angeles area. There's a lot of controversy over this one, which is why we're paying attention to it. Feminists in particular have said that this is a film that promotes harm to women. And Martin has more on it right now. Anne. Christine, the movie is Maniac, and the billboards themselves are pretty gruesome. Moviegoers tonight told me the plot is, a man who hated his mother goes out and kills women. Besides the billboard, the picture is also advertising as the movie the L.A. Times wouldn't run ads for. Now, President Eleanor Smeal had this reaction to the billboard. All I can say is, is that when you talk about violence towards women and brutality, this just typifies it, and I think that it is uh, shocking, and it contributes to the injury of women. Tonight, I asked moviegoers who had just seen the film if they thought it was potentially injurious to women. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to be scared to walk out at night, really, now. Do you think it was unfair to women? Yeah, I did. How about you? What did you think of it? 
I think it was a sick movie. It was where they, it was kind of stupid, you know? But it wasn't as scary as I planned it to be, like other movies I've seen, like Texas Chainsaw Massacre or something like that. Would you think that a movie like that would, uh, would inspire violence toward women? Yeah, I think some guys might have ideas uh, watching this, you know, if they're sick-minded coming in here, you never know. Two young men who were about to see Maniac said movies are fiction. It's real life that's scary. It bothers you to see some guy like Bittaker, for instance, who's convicted of doing torture and murder on young girls, but it doesn't bother you to see them. Well, no, not really, because in the movie, well, it's just a movie. It's fiction, but uh, in Bittaker's case, that's true. It freaks me out a little. Uh, this doesn't give you nightmares? No, not if you were a young woman, do you think it might? Yeah, definitely. I wouldn't be seen if I was a young woman. So far, the movie management there told me the movie is doing a fair business. This was its first Today, we look back at these slasher films and we think that they're uh, fun and cheesy and albeit harmless forms of entertainment. At the time, the country was really in an uproar over them. They were looked at, you know, along with heavy metal, one of the chief corruptors of America's youth. If you must. Hello, operator. Hide if you can. Scream if you are able, but above all, if you are alone, don't answer the phone. I killed them all. Don't answer the phone. Rated R. TV commercials like that one, exploiting the plight of women in danger, those ads have been saturating television for the past two years and the summer and fall of 1980 are the worst yet. They signify a disturbing new trend at the movie box office, one we'll be discussing on this special edition of Sneak Previews. Across the aisle from me is Gene Siskel, film critic of the Chicago Tribune. And this is Roger Ebert, film critic of the Chicago Sun-Times. Now, normally on Sneak Previews, Roger and I review new movies. This week, however, we're going to be looking at a group of recent films that have some very ugly things in common. All of these films are thrillers featuring extreme violence directed at young women. To put it bluntly, what you see in most of these films is a lot of teenage girls being raped or stabbed to death, usually both. This is a depressing development in American movies, and on this show, we'll examine the nature of this trend and then speculate on why we're getting so many of these films and getting them now. A lot of moviegoers, adults and teenagers, both go to see these R-rated films, and they assume, well, they're just going to see a bunch of routine, scary pictures. But oftentimes, they're really shocked how awful these films are. To begin with, one of the things these so-called women in danger films all have in common is that they portray women as helpless victims. And after you've sat through a dozen or so of these films, as Gene, or I, Gene and I have unfortunately had to, they all fall into the same pattern. A woman or a young girl is shown alone, isolated, and defenseless, and then comes suspense building scenes where the girl thinks she's about to be attacked, but she isn't. And then, just when you think everything's going to be okay and nothing's going to happen, a crazy killer springs out of the shadows and attacks her, and frequently the killer sadistically threatens the victim before he strikes. You know, a lot of people think that the battle has been won in Hollywood on films about women. They think that now women have parity with men, that uh, there's strong women images in the films, Jill Clayburgh and an unmarried woman, Jane Fonda, and every picture she makes, got it all wrong. Fonda and Clayburgh make a, one film a year maybe, right? These films are coming out week after week, playing to millions of people, and the dominant image in American films today on women is not Fonda and Clayburgh, it's women like that, cowering in the corner, knives being brandished in their faces, being raped, being sliced mm -hmm. apart. Mm -hmm. That's what's going on in American movies. That's why we're doing the show. I think a lot of people have the wrong idea. They identify these films with earlier thrillers like Psycho or even a more recent film like Halloween, which we both like. These films aren't in the same category. These films hate women. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, the audiences that go to them don't seem to like women too much either. Now, we go to see these films in movie theaters. These are not the kinds of movies where they have nice private little screenings <laughs> for the critics. And to sit there surrounded by people who are identifying not with the victim, but with the attacker, with the killer, who are cheering these killers on, is a very scary experience. Yeah, the movies are played so that they really are in favor almost of the killer and really against the women cowering back. I don't think we can stress this too strongly that we're not talking about a, just a couple of films. It seems like we're getting new ones of these kind of films every other week. That amounts to a major movie trend. Here are some examples. There's prom night with teenage girls being slaughtered at their high school prom. The ad campaign is, 
If you're not back by midnight, you won't be coming home. There's Don't Go In The House. A guy who was tortured by his mother burns three women to death. The cell line here is, you have been warned. And there's terror train in which six college students at a masquerade party on a train are stalked by a psychopath. And there's the boogeyman. A supernatural killer haunts a house. Here's one of the ads for the boogeyman. You can't hide from him. <laughs> By the time they believe in him, it'll be too late. The Boogeyman, he's going to get you. And we're out to get the Boogeyman before he gets you <laughs> and your four bucks. Now, week after week, these are the kinds of movies we're getting. It is relentless. Every film company seems to be making one of these movies or distributing one that some fast buck artist has already made. In addition to the films we've already mentioned this season, we also have... He Knows You Are Alone, Motel Hell, Phobia, Mother's Day, Schizoid, Silent Scream, and I Spit on Your Grave, which is easily the worst of this disgusting bunch. The newspaper ads for these films are bold in the way they suggest terror, but in no way in many cases do the ads really prepare you for the kind of explicit violence we end up getting on the screen. Decapitations are not uncommon, and shots, repeated stabbing shots of all parts of women's bodies are grotesquely routine. I think at this point somebody is probably wondering why. Why? Why exactly. now? Why is this happening? I have a theory. In the last couple of months that I've been seeing these pictures, I'm convinced it has something to do with the growth of the women's movement in mm -hmm. America in the last decade. I think that these films are some sort of primordial response <laughs> by some very sick people of men saying, get back in your place, women. Uh, these women in the films are typically portrayed as independent, as sexual, as enjoying life. And the killer typically, not all the time, but most often, mm -hmm. is a man who is sexually frustrated with these new aggressive women. And so he strikes back at them, he throws knives at them, he can't deal with them, he cuts them up, he kills them. Get back in your place, it's against the women's movement. I think you're basically right, Gene. You know, after you've sat through hour after hour of this complete trash, you begin to ask yourself, what did these female victims do to deserve the horrible attacks they undergo in these films? What was their crime? Why is it suddenly open season on young women in the movies? Well, one thing that most of the women victims do have is in common is that they do act independently, and I agree with you on that point. Mm -hmm. To one degree or another, they're liberated women who choose to act on their own, and the moment that a woman starts making decisions for herself in these movies, yeah. you can almost bet she's gonna end up paying with her life, and horribly. What's your problem? You, and kids like you. Very funny. One such film that was particularly shrouded in controversy was 1984's Silent Night, Deadly Night. The TV spots depicted a man dressed as Santa carrying an axe and murdering people, causing enraged parents to picket the movie during its opening weekend and subsequently got the movie banned. Although they clearly had not seen the film, many felt that it was wrong for Santa to be portrayed as a killer, not knowing the fact that it was actually a deranged and psychologically tortured man dressed as Santa during the killing as opposed to Kris Kringle himself. Still, despite the waves and waves of negative press, for the time being, the slasher genre continued to prosper and would go on to introduce us to its biggest icon yet. Freddy Krueger is every girl's dream and every girl's nightmare. I'm gonna have nightmares! Oh no! Oh no! Freddy is the ultimate nightmare. Freddy's, Freddy's way sociable. He's Freddy's a party awesome. animal. Freddy rocks. It's like Freddy is like addicting and you, you know it gets better and better each one. The scariest movie I've ever seen in a long time. I, I don't think I'll sleep tonight. When writer-director Wes Craven first imagined dream stalker Freddy Krueger, the ideas bouncing around in his head were equally sick and clever. While sleeping, people are at their most vulnerable, making it nearly impossible to stop Krueger from offing whomever he pleases in gory, imaginative ways. Furthermore, nobody can stay awake forever, so eventually, whether it's after a week or two months or longer, you're going to enter into Freddy's domain, and the outcome won't be ideal. This story. Freddy was a child murderer. The parents of his victims burn him alive, and about a decade later, he comes back and starts killing the remaining children of those parents in their dreams. Yeah, Nightmare on Elm Street was inspired by um, 
I think three articles in the LA Times over a period of about a year and a half. Um, the first one was kind of sketchy and it was the story of a, a, of a young man dying um, after having a severe nightmare and they couldn't figure out how it happened medically. And then there was a second story about nine months later and nobody, the newspaper didn't seem to correlate it. They didn't seem to remember the other story. And then the third story, and the one that really made me feel that I have to write a script about this was um, this kid. All these kids were Asian, all of them were Southeast Asia, all had come out of uh, kind of war zones from Vietnam and, and Pol Pot, the, you know, the culling fields. And their families had gone through location camps and then it ended up in the United States. Um, this kid was having nightmares and he said, somebody's after me in my nightmare and if I sleep I know I'm going to die. And his, his father was a physician. Um, and he said, I'll give you sleeping pills, you'll be all right. We've come through a horrible time, now we're in America, you're safe. Uh, and uh, the father started giving the kid sleeping pills and the kid supposedly was taking them. But he stayed up and he stayed up for something like five days. It was like an amazing, just you know, keeping himself awake almost by putting matchsticks in his eyes. <clears throat> and then finally he fell asleep while the family was watching television. And they took him upstairs and put him in bed and uh, the parents later said, you know, we were all convinced that crisis was over and um, in the middle of the night they heard screaming and thrashing and ran into his room and he was like kicking and screaming and they got to him and he just fell dead and he was dead and uh, there were three things that really just made me think this is a movie one was they did an autopsy on him and nothing was wrong there was no physical reason for it and the second was that they found the family said they found all the sleeping pills that supposedly he had taken uh, hidden, so he had obviously put them in his mouth and when dad wasn't looking it was right back out because he didn't want to sleep. And the third thing was this incredible thing, this kid had run an extension cord behind his bedroom curtains and into the closet and he had a Mr. Coffee in there with black coffee. So he had a source of keeping awake even when he was in his room supposedly sleeping. It was just so, it was heartrending because this kid, he was right, you know. He died as soon as he fell asleep. Freddie was based on um, I think it was based on a man who scared me when I was a little kid. Um, you know, again, my father was dead. There was always this sense that I had of it, like, nobody's around to really protect us, you know, because um, dad's gone. And uh, <clears throat> I, I just was lying in my bed. We had, were in a second story apartment and heard this guy sort of mumbling, grumbling, and shambling along. And once it had been down, it was this guy, kind of dressed like Freddie, you know, dark jacket, the sort of brimmed hat that they wore in those days. And he stopped and somehow just looked straight up at me. And um, I was just, I was so scared, you know, I just like jumped back and I was back in the shadows waiting for the sound of him going away. And I waited, waited, it seemed like I waited forever. And finally, well, he must have gone. And so I went back to the window and he was there and he just went, you know, and then he started walking down the sidewalk, looking over his shoulder at me, like, <clears throat> and he went into our building. So, I don't know who that guy was, but he became Freddy. My brother went down with a baseball bat and the guy ran away. So um, I guess my big brother saved my life. Who knows? He might have just thought, I'll, I'll scare this kid for the hell of it, you know? So that, that became the basis of Freddy, just the, sort of an adult that took delight in terrifying a child was the basis of it. And then um, the rest was actually a quite intellectual process of uh, uh, what, what will he wear? And I thought, you know, like an overcoat would be good. And, and then I thought of the idea of a janitor. So because, of, you know, I taught Greek mythology and the descent into Hades was always going down and fire. And so made his job basically being in Hades, you know. And the, the sweater, the striped sweater was a Scientific American article on the two colors that are the most difficult for the human retina to see side by side. So <laughs> that was those colors. Um, and the, there were a lot of films being made with villains that had masks, but I wanted him to be able to talk, so I said instead of a hockey mask or whatever, I'll give him a mask of scar tissue, and that'll be the way the parents kill him. And the final thing with the claws was, um, you know, we went through the usual thing of, shall it be a hunting knife, shall it be, uh, you know, a, a scythe, or should it be, you know, all this crap, and so I said, well, no, go back to the most primal weapon you can think of. And I thought, well, uh, it would be tooth and claw, you know, what men faced before they had real weapons. And then I thought, well, cave bears, you know, 
that claw that can come in and grab you. And then combining that with the human hand, uh, you had kind of the elements of both the ancient and the new, uh, you know, highly evolved, dexterous thing that makes humans so incredibly unique is our hands, you know. Um, so putting those two things together just made, made something that was pretty powerful. <laughs> It's funny, a friend, originally I was thinking uh, he should be a guy in his 70s and we looked at a lot of, you know, older gentlemen and they, you know, I think if you get to be 70, you're kind of like mellow. You know, you've, got, you've seen it all and you're just grateful to be alive and, and life has a lot more kind of preciousness to it. And so, uh, and then Robert England came in and it was like, not this guy, you know, he's too young. And he just had such an enthusiasm for it. And I, I found that, and then we looked at a lot of big stuntmen too, and I found stuntmen were very, also very gentle people in general, that they, they were so in control of their body and physicality, they didn't have these issues, you know, that people that are a little bit more normal and, you know, were beat up as kids or whatever. And Robert Englund just had no hesitation to play something really evil. And I realized that that was what it took. It didn't take an old guy, it didn't take a big guy. It took somebody who was comfortable you know, looking inside and saying, what would I be like if I was utterly evil? And a lot of people can't do that, you know. They don't want to go there, so they'll play it kind of bold, you know, kind of too big, or they'll kind of do a jokey, but, you know, Robert was willing, at least in the first one, to be serious, and that's what worked. The beginning of these films for me was, I believe it was my second audition for the film. I went to a casting office in Hollywood, and it was very crowded. There were it seemed like 12 or 15, you know, young women, and we were each going in one by one, and I got to go in with Amanda Wiss, and I, we went in together, and uh, I read for Wes, and I remember during the reading, it just, I was just compelled to make my fingers into this shape and say, it was just a part in the dialogue where I'm describing my dream and I just had this little claw that just, just became alive somehow and, uh, and I think Wes really liked that and uh, he let everybody go except for me and, uh, and he came out and he said I'd like you to know that I'd like you to be Nancy and I just that never happens in Hollywood they always have your agent call your people and it's always it's never like that, and that's the kind of man Wes was. I always uh, felt when we were filming the first movie that it's rare in in modern films, and certainly the films that I've seen in my life, where the um, protagonist and the antagonist are so um, clearly defined and represent actually represent good and evil with no equivocation at all, and. Um, Robert England and I talked a lot about the underlying, you know, symbolism of our our battle. And Robert is a very intelligent person and very highly trained actor. So he, in a lot of ways, encouraged me to think of the battle on much, like more, you know, archetypal level, if I can use that word. And, um, and so, and he and I even today talk about it as if we're talking about a Greek tragedy. We don't, we've never thought of it literally as popular teenager slasher film. We always have had the respect for it that Wes was able to create a modern myth about, you know, the struggle between good and evil. And, um, and as the issues of Nancy's became more developed, first you just see her as a teenager, then you see her as the child of a divorced family, and then you see her as a, um, a person who's very concerned about her friends. And then in the later films, she's trying to take care of teenagers and a social worker type, and then finally she's a mother of her own child and a wife. She, you know, and we often, you know, Wes, is very, um, I think, concerned that her story was um, always toward the good and what our what our ideals and virtues um, are all about in our society. And we always talked about those things. And and Robert and I, we enjoyed being enemies, and we were always, you know, playing those kind of 
tricks and stuff on each other as that. After we had finished the first film, it was it was such a small film. I mean, our budget was so small. And I and when we had the screening, we had it in a little screening room at Warner Brothers, and. Uh, me and Johnny had arrived late and Amanda Wiss and, and all of the people had come to my house first and uh, we'd had you know a little celebration we got to the theater and there were no seats for us so we had to sit on the floor and the fire marshal came and told us we couldn't show the film because um, the, the theater wasn't big enough so some people either left or we ended up sitting on the floor I mean it was so small film it, written all over it you know and our clothes had all come from the you know, Salvation Army, basically. Maybe with some new socks thrown in here and there. It was pathetic when I think about it. And uh, and then they made the second one, and I thought, oh, I can't believe they're doing that. I mean, of course it was successful, so I could believe that they were doing that, but to me, I was very glad, like, I don't want to be part of that. And then I remember a trick-or-treater came to my door who was dressed as Freddy, and I went, He's big. He's a household name. Freddy Krueger is it. And I was in college at the time, and frat, frat fraternities were having parties, and people were coming dressed as Freddy. And no one ever came dressed as Nancy, <laughs> but people came dressed as Freddy. And I and I thought, well, this is even getting bigger. And and I realized this is a this is what they're going to make a lot of money off of. And I never thought I'd be part of it again. And then Wes and Wes had had a falling out with New Line Cinema, so I knew. I was kind of attached to him, and um, I knew I wouldn't be a part. And then they let Wes write the third, the screenplay for the third one. And he called me and said, I'd like to put your character back in, and I'd only want to do this if you said now that you would be in it. And, you know, the same gracious way that he always does things. And I, I said, oh, he called me on my birthday. I said, this is the best birthday present I could have ever gotten. I said, this is, and I assumed he would direct it, and I was like, of course, I'm so excited. And then he didn't, he wasn't signed up to direct after all, and uh, Chuck Russell came in and he rewrote. And so we made that film. And, you know, by then it was just on its own. Nightmares. They have a way of coming back. First you have one, then another. And before you can scream yourself awake, you find yourself plunging into a nightmare on Elm Street 3, Dream Warriors. Yes, it's your favorite bad dream, once again slashing its way into the hearts of America with... Hold it right there, Squidness! If you think I'm gonna settle for a, just another sleazeball video promotion, you must be dreaming! Show some respect, buddy! This ain't your average drive-in movie schlock we got here! Nightmare 3 scared up $25 million in its first two weeks in release. The total grosses, <laughs> so to speak, are now over $40 million. It scored the biggest opening for any independent film ever. Why? Why, you ask? Freddy Krueger, that's why, sucker. That's right, it's the return of cult hero Freddy Krueger, the same vile maniac who helped turn the first two nightmares into video blockbusters. Nightmare 1, 120,000 units. Nightmare 2, 180,000 units. Together, these two hits spent over 50 weeks on Billboard's rental charts. And for the past two summers, Freddy's Nightmares have been the nation's top video rental titles. Now, it's Freddy's third time around, and he's all set to claw his way beyond the 200,000 mark. Only 200,000? Wake up and smell the coffee, bud. It's got to be a lot more than 200 thou. You see, I have right here my own special sales incentive plan. <laughs> TV clips ready. Uh, okay, uh, enough about my uh, persuasive abilities. Tell them about America's insatiable Freddy fetish. Ah. Right. With the release of Nightmare 3, Freddy slashed his way to the top. He's a media phenomenon with featured appearances on TV shows across the country. It's the biggest nightmare ever, but nobody's going to lose sleep over this one. Well, maybe the makers of Platoon, because for the very first time in history, a small independent film has swept the weekend box office grosses. And the top money-making film this past weekend 
is Nightmare on Elm Street 3 Dream Warriors with $8.8 million in ticket revenues. The number one movie in the country last week in Syracuse. They called in the mounted police to control the crowds at theaters. Out in Los Angeles, they chanted Freddy. And Freddy. guest spots on such nationally broadcast hits as Good Morning America and The Late Show with Joan Rivers. My first guest has become a real cult figure for his slimy portrayal of Freddy Krueger with his razor edge glow. I know. For those of you who don't know who we're talking about, here is a picture. This is his third. He's, this is, yeah, can you get this on channel? Okay. Uh, this is his third film now called Nightmare on Elm Street. It's the third one. The movie is just open and it's a blockbuster. They made $30 million in one week alone. That's you telling me, woo woo. Will you please welcome Rich Robert England? All right. Oh, oh. Uh, oh. I'm the, the worst. Don't leave home without it. But wait, there's more. And I ain't talking about a money back slice of Matic offer either. <laughs> Check out the awesome in-store onslaught we've whipped up. Right. Video stores are in for their biggest nightmare ever, beginning with Freddy's arrival on this ghastly in-store banner. What a profile. A traffic-stopping wall poster. Colorful, huh? <laughs> a hair-raising 3D poster for your special media light box. Disgusting enough for you, huh? And a monstrous, larger-than-life floor display, guaranteed to have your customers screaming for... Hey, who else? Uh, nice, uh, nice lights, huh? Plus, Freddy's got a killer contest under his hat that's guaranteed to cause an Elm Street traffic jam in your store. Announcing Freddy's Be In My Nightmare sweepstakes. The grand prize, a once-in-a-lifetime chance to appear on screen with Freddy in the upcoming Nightmare on Elm Street 4. We'll alert your customers to this fabulous promotion with spots on MTV and ads in Prime Youth Market magazines like Rolling Stone, Us, Circus, and Fangoria. It's a Fright Fanatic's dream come true. No! Yes. Ask your media representative about this limited time offer. Don't get caught sleeping. Wake up your profit picture with a feverishly anticipated video release of A Nightmare on Elm Street 3, Dream Warriors. Coming soon from Media Home Entertainment. The term deranged sociopath <laughs> gets thrown around a lot by the media, but it really applies to my next guest. Starting today, you can see him in Friday the 13th, Part 8. Jason Takes Manhattan. Please welcome Jason. really noticed you're angry <laughs> and I, I don't mean to laugh excuse me it's just the way I am but you're you're you're, you're angry what happened man How, where did it all begin was it a woman uh, did you get cut from the hockey team in high school what happened what's up <laughs> okay let me ask you this um, <laughs> I saw the new movie, Jason Takes Manhattan. Um, you killed 16 people. <laughs> I don't know why I'm laughing, man. <laughs> uh, you killed 16 people, and you were responsible for the death of eight others. Total, that's less than what you usually kill in a movie. <laughs> Are you getting soft? Are you losing a step? In fact, it wasn't just the Friday the 13th franchise I was indeed losing a step. 
blood gushingly great kills couldn't sustain a genre that spiraled into creative bankruptcy as the 1980s came to a close. Freddy Krueger became a joke slinging parody of himself, and Jason just got kinda monotonous, and horror was no longer a fringe interest for teenage moviegoers. The slasher genre would of course show its face in the years that followed, but it would never be the same. The slasher movies of the 2000s had mostly, with a few notable exceptions, taken the form of remakes. Everything from A Nightmare on Elm Street to Prom Night got a glossy update that banked on nostalgia, but in reality, all they did was make us cherish the slashers of yesteryear even more. Ambitions were meek, their achievements meeker still, and their cost to profit ratio stellar. Now pardon us while we watch Tom Savini get his head blown off with a shotgun at point blank range. 